My name is Kate Shoveler, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Animal Biosciences. Uh, I obtained my undergraduate degree in animal biology from the University of Guelph and my PhD from uh, the University of Alberta. I've spent time in government, uh, in the pet food industry, and I'm now an academic at the University of Guelph. What brought me to this research uh, was most companion animal and equine nutritionists. Uh, while we would love to focus on only a few things, uh, we tend to focus very broadly. And one of the things that my lab does is looks at new ingredients for um, these companion animal industries. And the oil that we're investigating in this trial, camelina oil, uh, does not have the uh, physiological research that most ingredients do. So that led us to ask the question of how similar or different uh, camelina oil and its effects are in both dogs and horses with a particular um, focus on functional outcomes. So does camelina oil change the fatty acid uh, components? Does it improve inflammatory markers? And does it improve or support skin and coat in both of these species too? So this is a long-term study or what we would call a parallel design. And so we had three different groups of uh, client-owned dogs. And those client-owned dogs, uh, we first gave them what we call a wash-in diet. So we standardize everybody and make sure everybody's at the same starting point at the beginning. And then we take baseline measures and we continue with those same measures throughout the entire feeding of those diets to dogs. Uh, when you look at different oils, the first thing that you want to look at is the uh, whether the fatty acid composition of that oil, how quickly it then alters the fatty acid composition in the blood. Um, and in other species, we look at tissues, but uh, we'll be using blood and the lipid fractions in that blood um, to look at how fatty acid content changed in the dogs. Uh, then in the blood, we will also be measuring different kinds of um, markers of inflammation and anti-inflammation. And then in terms of skin and coat, we have both subjective and objective markers. And so our objective marker is um, we take a look at how much water is lost from the skin. As an example, elderly would lose more water from their skin than an adult would, for example. So we also have a wide range of uh, aged dogs on our study. And if these different oils uh, support um, skin turnover, then what we'll see is we'll see less water loss from that skin as their skin and coat improves. In terms of the subjective markers of skin and coat, um, you can look at how much uh, the dogs shed, how much dander they have on them, and then you can also ask um, individuals to score how shiny they think the coat is. And so those are more subjective because you might think a dog looks shinier than I do and you will score it higher. So those are a little bit more subjective versus the water loss, which is a, is a quantitative measure. We wanted to make sure that we standardized the dog. So every two weeks before each sample day, we would bathe the dogs. Um, and to do that, we used a calculation, a surface area calculation to determine how much soap each dog gets. Um, so we just made sure to bathe them before that two week period because that's really when the results are affected is within the two weeks before that period. My role with this project is mainly looking at transepidermal water loss um, as that's a sign of skin barrier function. I'm also looking at pro and anti-inflammatory biomarkers so that'll give us a good idea on how the dog's skin barrier function is working. So part of what we're doing in our study here is we take blood samples um, at every sample day. So at week zero, two, four, 10, and 16, we've been taking blood samples from the dogs. So part of that is to get the plasma for the inflammatory and non-inflammatory biomarkers. Um, the kind of the part that I'll be looking at is we're using the serum from the blood and we're gonna use gas chromatography in order to kind of look at the lipid fractions in the blood. So that will kind of give us an idea of 
which dietary oil supplement is going to be preferable and what's going to create a more desirable fatty acid profile in the dog's blood and see how that is being integrated into their bodies. So you may was a very beautiful coat coming in already. Um, so it's hard to kind of assess that with her, but as you can see, it's still very nice and pretty. Um, I did just brush her, so it's very poofy right now. Um, but we had, did have some dogs who started their study and they were much more lower skin quality, you'd say, um, you know, black dogs who looked a little bit more reddy or browny, um, kind of poor, poor quality there. So we definitely did see an improvement in those and I was looking very closely at all of that. So it was really rewarding in a lot of ways to see how that changed throughout the study. Now the question is, we, we hypothesized that Camelina and flax, and of course Camelina's ancient flax, uh, that they'll have a similar uh, effect on in, uh, markers of inflammation in skin and coat health. So flax is what we would call our positive control. And then, cam uh, then canola has a poorer um, N6 fatty acid to N3 ratio. And so we expect that canola um, will have less of a effect on all of those parameters in both dogs and horses. The study was very successful. We, uh, only one dog dropped out from the study. And so we have the numbers that we hope that we were gonna get, which is one of the most important things when you're trying to do science is you can't make conclusions for a population based on only a few um, observations. So we tried to make sure that we had sufficient dogs and we had more than enough outcomes that we felt confident in our conclusions in our comparisons of the oils. I think the results will be very helpful in determining what oil supplement will be best for dogs and horses. I think specifically the fatty acid results and the biomarkers will be super helpful and even the subjective skin and coat health assessment will be really cool to see. So I think it'll be really helpful. I'm an associate professor of equine physiology in the Department of Animal Biosciences at the University of Guelph. Um, I've been full-time here since 2016 and was part-time teaching in the equine program for eight years before that. Um, after I finished my doctorate here, I did my PhD at the vet college here at uh, the University of Guelph in biomedical toxicology. Well, oils is an interesting thing for horses because typically horses don't have a very high fat content in their diet, unlike dogs that can tolerate quite a lot of fat. Horses, not so much. So um, a lot of the, the work that's kind of contemporary in terms of uh, feeding oils and fats to horses is as it pertains to skin and coat health. Um, mainly because, you know, horse people, like dog people, they, they really desire that, you know, that sheen, that shine that makes the horse look very healthy. Um, I'm very interested in camelina oil as it pertains to a development of, of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory compounds that result from, mainly from metabolism of different kinds of fats. So the types of fats that are in camelina oil are less inflammatory than, than some of some other types of fat. So uh, we kind of prefer the N3 to N6 ratio in camelina oil as opposed to, for example, canola oil that has a much higher N6 fatty acid content. I mean, one of the interesting things about horses as compared to other livestock species is they tend to live till they're old, right? So, you know, you don't often hear about, you know, chickens and, I don't know, beef cattle living to the age of 25 but it's not uncommon at all for a horse to do that. So they, you know, if a horse is lucky enough to get to that age in life, it's almost inevitable that they're gonna have some kind of degenerative type joint condition. And, and a lot of the, the medications that are available to us for managing the symptoms, they can be kind of destructive over the longer term. So they have adverse effects like they can actually slow down metabolism of cartilage, they can actually accelerate breakdown of cartilage over time. So those are not good um, you know, strategies for managing arthritis in the longer term. So we really wanna find nutritional type interventions that can delay some of the onset of these very de destructive type pathways. And camelina oil is a great opportunity for that. So, 
you know, the, the study that we're embarking on very shortly is going to be the first of its kind to really be able to demonstrate, well, what is the effect of altering the fatty acid content of the diet as it pertains to production of inflammatory biomarkers? So um, that's ultimately the goal from the equine study. Well, we're going to be doing a lot of the same measures in the horses that we have done in the dogs. So a lot of the same subjective type measures that Kate talked about with respect to coat quality. Um, we'll be doing a lot of those with the expectation that we will have an improvement in overall coat quality um, when the horses are on, have the camelina in their diet. Um, but I predict that we're going to see some effect on coat condition and coat quality. What I'm really interested to see is the effect on the anti-inflammatory biomarkers that we're looking at. That one's going to be pretty